Law of the Old World, Chapter 18, Part 2 The Laws of Magic In the heat of battle, mighty wizards summon columns of fire to burn through the enemy. In the deadly swirl of melee combat, powerful warrior mages smite their foes with fists that fall like hammers. In the Old World and beyond, battle magic is one of the most widely practiced magical arts, for here, battle is the one constant in life. Unlike many wizards who spend long hours in darkened rooms studying their arcane arts by candlelight, practitioners of battle magic tend to be hardy individuals, as at home on the battlefield as they are in their libraries. This is because, unlike other laws that may be studied, battle magic is openly offensive and tailored towards use upon the field of battle, which, given the law's name, should come as no surprise. And it is here that masters of the law hone their skill. Practitioners of battle magic are favoured by cunning generals all across the old world and beyond, and their services are often in high demand. Many an opposing army has been undone by devastating fireballs cast from afar, found a cloying mist obscuring their view, their path blocked by a bend in the river that was not there before, or their courage sapped as arrows fell upon them with supernatural accuracy. Those that wield battle magic will draw their power from whichever of the winds of magic suits their purpose. They grasp at the red wind, summoning forth fire from the air to rain upon the enemy, the green wind to armour themselves with the strength of oak, the grey wind to cow and demoralise their foe, and more besides. To a battle mage, the incorporeal dangers of harnessing several winds of magic at once are of little concern. What matters most is turning the tide and ensuring swift victory. Those that make study of the realm of chaos, that twisted and warped netherworld in which the ruinous powers reside, are known as demonologists. These cursed souls are drawn to their study in the vain hope of gaining mastery over the demonic denizens of that realm and turning their power against the gods of chaos. Seldom are such noble intentions realised, for those that converse with demons are inevitably corrupted by their whispered lies. When a denizen of the old world thinks of demons, they imagine the nightmare servants of the chaos powers. Yet the pantheon of demonic beings is far greater than this. Within the realm of chaos there dwells an infinite number of creatures that owe no allegiance to the ruinous powers. Such creatures often manifest within the mortal realm, some masquerading as elemental sprites, mischievous spirits of house and earth, others possessing a host and bending it to their will. In truth, denizens of the old world think of demons rarely, fearful that doing so might summon them forth. In this superstitious belief, demonologists are not like others. Through rituals and invocations shared and perfected within secretive covens, they endeavour to summon forth the most powerful of demons, hoping to entrap them and bind them to their will. Some use props in their craft, binding demonic servants into mundane items such as books, oil lamps, staffs, even weapons of war. Thus bound, a demon becomes subservient to the wizard that summoned it, and must comply with its master's wishes. Yet demons are ever dishonest, their words and deeds selfish and cruel. Consequently, most demonologists quickly fall foul of the very beings they believed they had mastered. For all their mysticism and ritual, their secret orders and wealth of arcane knowledge, demonologists are not the enlightened seekers of truth many believe themselves to be. They are mere slaves to the powers they seek to master. There are no champions of chaos, only the lost and the damned. Once, only pure magic flowed into the world, whole and unsullied. It was a natural force under the control of a race of godlike beings. With the coming of chaos, this was to change, as a darker, more unstable form of magic was unleashed into the mortal realm, one which refused to be chained by the hand of any mere mortal. With the collapse of the polar gates, chaos came into the world. As it did, the pure and refined magic harnessed by the old ones came into contact with its influence for the first time within the mortal realm. Almost immediately the corrupting power of chaos began to work upon it, as surely as it did the bodies and minds of mortals. 
Twisted and warped by chaos, the unseen strands of colour that composed pure magic merged and bled into one another, causing the winds of magic to grow blackened and ever more unstable. Amongst the elves of Ulthan, there were those drawn to this phenomenon, sensing a raw source of power, magic which could be mastered more easily, they began to experiment with its use. Quickly most learned the dangers, that magic corrupted by chaos would quickly corrupt those that sought to master it, yet there were those that persisted. Today dark magic still torments the world, wherever the touch of chaos is felt most strongly. The winds of magic twist and coalesce into dark, roiling clouds. Many wizards feel compelled to study and use dark magic, wielding it with careless abandon, enraptured by its potency and the apparent ease of its mastery. Yet those that dabble with dark magic are fools, for dark magic is like nothing so much as the raw stuff of chaos, and its use is a path to certain damnation and eternal servitude. All across the old world there dwell wizards able to bend the winds of magic to their will to such an extent that they can harness the power of the elements themselves to do their bidding. Such mages summon gale force winds and torrential rains from the heavens, raise earthen ramparts and even call forth elemental spirits to do their bidding. Wizards that study elementalism will often hide their art from the uneducated masses for the powers they wield can easily be mistaken for darker arts, such as demonology or necromancy, summoning as they do elemental spirits from the etheric netherworld. But for all the suspicion that haunts their study, their abilities are often in great demand. Many a farming community has sought out the aid of an elementalist to end a period of drought. Their ability to summon rain from a clear sky, the difference between a prosperous and a failed harvest. Many a ship's captain will seek an elementalist service for long and dangerous voyages, hoping that their charms can deliver favourable winds and settle a restless ocean. Still other elementalists conceal their craft behind a more mundane facade. Still other elementalists conceal their craft behind a more mundane facade. Many a skilled blacksmith or farrier secretly manipulates the red wind to heat their forge and the iron that glows within it by arcane means, producing works of great wonder. Other elementalists prefer to turn their magical powers to a different, more scientific purpose, melding arcane knowledge of the yellow wind and study of natural philosophy within the halls of academia to study alchemy. In battle, the powers an elementalist wields are a considerable blessing. Able as they are to disrupt the enemy lines, entrench and defend their own, even cause the weapons of allies to burn with the heat of their forging, whilst the armour of their foes crumbles to rust. In its purest form, magic glistens like a silver haze that fills the air, visible in and around all things to those gifted with the mage sight. It is a wondrous thing, there to be manipulated by those with the talent and the learning. With long decades of study, a mage can pure magic to perform almost any deed imaginable, but the work is exhausting and the rituals complex. With the collapse of the polar gates, a torrent of magic was unleashed, the gentle clouds of silvery light becoming gusted gales and swirling storms. Upon completion of the High Elves' great ritual, performed to lessen the magic flooding the world, the arcane works of the Old Ones shattered, causing the silver light of magic to fragment revealing the kaleidoscopic winds of magic. Students of high magic study each of these winds closely, becoming intimately familiar with their properties and potential over long years. With mastery of each wind, the mage edges closer to understanding high magic, and eventually becomes able to draw all of the winds together, crafting high magic. This may seem similar to the use of dark magic, similar even to the lesser laws of magic. It is not. Where other wizards grasp clumsily at the winds of magic, or warp them into darker huge, high mages carefully bring all eight winds together, seeking the silvery light of pure magic and crafting spells of such sublime potency that lesser wizards are struck dumb to witness. A simple fireball cast by a battle mage may burn hot with the power of the red wind, 
but one conjured by a high mage will burn incandescently bright, searing the world and blinding all that gaze upon it. Such is the power of high magic. The art of illusion is a strange law of magic. Where most wizards wield their arcane might to change the world around them in direct fashion, illusionists prefer to change the world in subtle ways, hiding their power to control minds and emotions behind the facade of stagecraft and trickery. For an illusionist, it is the glamour and splendour of the casting itself, the use of magical power to confound and confuse. That is the aim of their country. Many illusionists travel the old world, manipulating the innocent and subjecting the unwary to their will. Others find shelter within the entourage of a powerful lord or lady, masquerading as entertainers before courtiers and guests. Almost all maintain a presence of stagecraft in everything they do, carefully crafted charms working to befuddle the minds of those around them, lulling an audience into an almost trance-like state in which the illusionist victims remain convinced that no matter how overt the magic practice before their eyes, they are witnessing a simple mummer's act. Behind this pretense, illusionists practice a profane art which thrives upon deceit and misdirection. They work the winds of magic in subtle ways, crafting mirage images that fill the mind with counterfeit memories and imposter emotions. It is by these means that illusionists are able to manipulate those around them, bending them to their will causing them to react to realities that are not in fact real. Illusion is perhaps the most dangerous of laws, both for those that practice it as well as those that witness it. A careless illusionist can find themselves drawn into their own deceits, the winds of magic entrapping them, pulling their mind into a world that does not truly exist. Of all the mages that study the laws of magic, those that practice the art of necromancy are the most shunned and reviled, yet simultaneously often the most sought after. Necromancy is the study of death, and of more than death, necromancy is the means by which those trapped within the mortal coil can penetrate through the shroud of death into Moore's dark realm, to commune with the spirits of the departed and witness the wisdom of ancestors. Necromancers make use of the darker winds of magic, the purple wind of death and the grey wind of shadow most often, melding them with the green wind of life and the amber wind of beasts. From these disparate strands of etheric power they craft charms and incantations that grant them a power to reach beyond death's embrace. With this power necromancers summon spirits and commune with the dead, channeling the spirits of the departed that they may speak with the living. Still others take their study further into the dark, dallying with the blackest of magics, the raw power of chaos. Some utilize foul warpstone to enhance their control of this writhing evil force, using the wicked material to draw bleak power ever more closely about their withered forms, channeling this dark energy into the husks of dead things and crafting vile unlife from cold, lifeless corpses pulled from the dark earth. For every necromancer gainfully employed in spiritualism, communing with the souls of departed loved ones, there is certain to be another skulking in graveyards and mausoleums, disturbing the dead and seeking to extend their own life by means magical and profane. This is why necromancers are so untrusted and unloved, for honest and good citizens of the old world can never be sure just how deep into the shadows a necromancer has delved. When orc and goblin tribes march to war, as they are given to do with alarming regularity, they are accompanied by powerful shamans. These weird boy and odd git shamans, as orcs and goblins call them, are each a living conduit to Gork and Mork, the primitive gods of their kind, and each can wield such arcane might that even the most learned of elven mages would have to be impressed. The power of orc and goblin shamans does not come primarily from the winds of magic, but from the raw war magic radiated by their kind. A potent force barely understood by mages of other races, war magic can consume the winds of magic, absorbing them and deadening them, made sight of other wizards. As orcs and goblins rush into battle, the war rises in great storms that spring forth to drown entire regions, 
before draining away once more, leaving only wisps of magical potential behind. An orc or goblin shaman, blessed by Gork, or possibly Mork, can focus the war through the power of their mind, such as it is, casting spells as brutal and cunning as Gork and Mork themselves. These shamans have been known to burst the skulls of their foes, to shoot beams of cackling green death from their beady eyes, or to summon almighty green appendages from the skies to punch and kick the enemy. Yet with the power comes great peculiarity, and shamans are our most peculiar breed. Constant exposure to the raw war and the will of their gods causes orcs and goblins to become somewhat unhinged. Consequently, their shamans are prone to drifting into trances, breaking uncontrollably into spasmodic dancing, and talking animatedly to unseen entities. Of course, for the average orc and goblin, such behaviour is a bonus. After all, how can one be impressed by a wizard that doesn't act the part?